welcome everyone um, to this first panel discussion that brings together a group of incredible artists whose work is presented in Relations, Diaspora and Painting, which just opened yesterday um, at Phi Foundation for Contemporary Art in Montreal. Um, before we get started, uh, it's important to acknowledge where we are, that, uh, well, at the Phi Foundation anyway, is located on unceded Indigenous lands, and that the Gahian Gaga Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters on which we gather today. And Jojage, Montreal, is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. And today, it's the home of uh, a diverse population of Indigenous and other peoples, and we respect the continued connections with the past, present, and future in our ongoing relationships um, with Indigenous and other peoples within um, the Montreal community, but around the world too. Nous aimerions reconnaître que la Fondation Chi est située en territoire autochtone, lequel n'a jamais été cédé. Nous reconnaissons que la nation Kanyagaka, comme gardienne des terres et des eaux sur lesquelles nous réunissons aujourd'hui. Jojage, Montréal, est historiquement connu comme un lieu de rassemblement pour de nombreuses Premières Nations et aujourd'hui une population autochtone diversifiée, ainsi que d'autres peuples y résident. C'est dans le respect des liens avec le passé, le présent et l'avenir que nous reconnaissons les, les relations continues entre les peuples autochtones et autres personnes de la communauté montréalaise. I want to thank um, Waisan Shian Whitebean uh, for the writing of this acknowledgement. So, you know, now I want to just thank from the bottom of my heart and welcome, you know, our, our artist panel, Curtis Talway Santiago, who is in Munich, Germany, um, doing the night shift with us. Maya Cruz Palaleo, who is in New York. Manuel Mathieu, who for the time being anyways, is here in Montreal. Rick Leong, who is uh, live uh, from Victoria, British Columbia. Hello. And Rajni Pereira, who joins us from Toronto. Hello. Welcome all. So over the last two weeks, um, I've had the immense pleasure of carrying out these like little interviews, um, conversations with each of you. Um, and, the, and we've recorded them so that we'll be able to share those um, with everybody very soon. And it'll give you um, a deeper dive into um, their works. The process has been great, like doing these little interviews because it's helped me to kind of fashion a few questions together that I thought, you know, each of you might be able to, to speak to. And so the way that we're gonna do the panel is that for the first 45 minutes roughly, we're gonna um, address these questions um, that have been cobbled together. And then following that, um, we're gonna make some space for all of us to join into the discussion. And my colleague, Rehab Essay, will lead a question and answer period, um, starting with a few of her own questions to break the ice. Um, and so also just to save time, we added um, quick bio notes on each of the artists on the panel today in the chat. So if you want to know a little bit more and, 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 and um, if anybody has any uh, questions, you can access the chat. Um, right, so you can also add your questions to the Q&A through the chat as well. Um, and then Rehab will address them in order uh, according to the time we have. So, sound okay? Yes, sounds great. Awesome. So by the way of a preamble for those who may be new to the exhibition, Relations, Diaspora and Painting is a group exhibition that brings together artists whose work explores the complex and multiple meanings of diaspora, its condition and its experiences uh, as expressed through painting from diverse perspectives, methodologies and aesthetic languages. With that in mind, I'm throwing out the first question to the panel and um, I would love, we'd love to hear from each of you. So here goes, I realized that while an artist may be exploring questions around memory, kinship, or identity um, that are clearly linked 
in my, you know, to a kind of diasporic consciousness that they may not necessarily situate or want to situate themselves as working from or through the ideas of diaspora. So I'm wondering at what point each of you started to locate your questions um, through your work with the concepts and themes related to diaspora and to see those as part of say like a diasporic perspective. Um, did that connection or understanding occur early in life or, or later or, or, or when did it happen? Um, whoever wants to go, go first. Coming out of school or like, you know, being in art school, which is such a funny, weird place to be, but it's like being in there and being like a visible minority in like a heavily colonized curriculum art school, which was majority white and feeling really sort of disenchanted with the canon that I was presented with. For me, it was like, I realized that there's a lot of immigrant or diasporic artists that don't really want to. Hi. They don't really want to. That's my daughter. <laughs> 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 Hello. They don't really want yeah. to um, uh, subscribe to that or like work under like notions of identity politics or like that be their cultural product that's going forward. But for me, because of like the severe underrepresentation that I was faced with and that I was really frustrated with, um, having to build my own curriculum, having to build my own canon and being like really, really sort of fed up. Um, for me, it was like my duty. Like I was like, I felt I felt responsible in a lot of ways. So, so I don't, I'm not sure what to, what I would, you know, what advice I would say give to artists who who don't really want to perform under, um, or don't want to perform their identity politics for a for a, um, a sort of white settler institutions. But but I have other reasons where I was feeling responsible. For me, I think um, the thinking about the diaspora is in direct relation to where I am. And for me, it started, it started to really be prevalent in my work. And I think through my work, the different bodies of work function different ways. And the specific body of work that's being shown at the foundation is around Carnival and Trinidad and thinking about ancestry. Because when I arrived in America, the, the, the code and the cues of the diaspora the diaspora I was used to from being in Toronto completely, completely switched. And I found myself lost being like, well, here I identify when people see me visually, I'm, I'm of African descent. So not knowing you can't visually tell Canadian or American, I am African American, but then getting with a group of African American artists and beginning to just talk and, and vibe, there was nuances that, Glissant would often reference where we were in relation, but there were these differences. And in order for me to like engage with the community and for them to understand a bit more of who I was or where I'm coming from, I think I, that's when I really started to focus on, okay, what is what does the diaspora mean? Because it, the, the context completely shifted the base on where your body is. Great, awesome, thank you. Thanks, Curtis. I love hearing your your stories. These are amazing. I, I wish I found something like this earlier in my life because I think uh, you know what Curtis is saying and the the diaspora stories or um, they're all different. They're all unique. Um, no no one no two are the same. And that's something that I think that uh, you know like Rajni was saying here in art school. I think that's something that students need to hear. That there is no set way of having to explore that and visualize that for yourself or for others or for whoever. It can be whatever that you want it to be kind of self-determinatory in that way. Um, uh, which wasn't necessarily my experience. I, I think for me, uh, I, I got into it more in art school. Um, I, I kind of felt that pressure a little bit, but I was also very interested in it. I, I, for me, I wasn't inculcated into Chinese culture growing up, so and I didn't speak the language. So for me, art and visual language was my way in. It was like the side door that I was going to go in and I was going to explore it on my own terms. And I worked through it through making, through creating. And, you know, sometimes I tried to reject it 
and but it just kept bubbling up, kept coming forward. It's like you know, after a while, I was like, you know, this is just who I am. Um, and once I embraced that, uh, you know, you know, more towards grad school, just coming out of grad school, um, the more uh, the more grounded, the more whole I felt. The more I don't, I don't know, a complete the right word. But the more true to myself, I feel like I was being. The the my 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 experience was was different, and I can somehow find myself in each one of you, you know, at one point or at an, or another, because there was a sense of rejection at some point, or actually composing, because it wasn't rejection. But to be honest, my first encounter. And it's still happening. It's when I was exposed to the other, you know, and the other, I mean, culturally, because I, I left Haiti, I was 19 years old um, to come to study here. Yes, I was traveling to, to Canada sometimes during the summer. And it was during these trips that I was encountering the other and the gaze of the other, you know, after that, I had this gaze through institutions because I went to school. I went to universities uh, and I was in a society where the society was trying to define me constantly because uh, they didn't know, I don't know for what reasons, it could be their own fragility, it could be their own necessity to control, whatever it is. I was at the mercy of this gaze and that's where the, the power within myself, the balance to find that. Uh, is this gaze, can I trust this gaze? What is this gaze trying to get out of me? What is this space this gaze actually wants, wants me to occupy? Uh, and all these questions, and these are questions that are still being answered today because at every step, there's new, new things happening, new nuances, new, new uh, problems and new solutions also because I'm also learning to navigate. Um, but it all started with the encounter of the other. You know, when there was a, a clear understanding of, okay, I am something that, I'm with something else, with somebody else. You know, and it started the ground of understanding where to go from there. Um, I was like sitting here nodding my head at everything everyone was saying, um, a little bit of everything that was said. And uh, I think for me, um, I, I didn't really, I don't think I set out to think about diaspora, um, but I do, I think for me, the way I got into art was through looking at who the people were around me. And um, I was interested in who they were, which happened to be, you know, my family. And, um, and I was curious about their um, sort of stories about what it was like for them growing up in the Philippines, because I was born in Chicago and, and I never lived there. So I was always really curious about that. And I did, you know, um, have some experiences where I went to the Philippines and I felt this big gap um, between, you know, my experience and, and the experience of being there. And I think I just, for me, it, it was wanting to sort of learn more about that and sort of kind of close in on that gap or fill in those. There was a lot of blanks that I felt um, in that sense. And then I also feel like in, I, again, in art school too, um, where there was this, uh, like Manuel said, the other, uh, suddenly, someone's questioning um, this person that's in a painting or an image from this other way that I, you know, didn't think about before. And then, and then it became more and more important um, for me to sort of dive deeper into that. Um, those uh, places where, um, of the, of the stories that I was hearing uh, growing up. So, and then that became much more, um, connected to the larger uh, connections between the Philippines and the United States. And so that just became, it just kept getting more and more interesting for me. Um, and um, yeah, I think, um, and yeah, I'm, I, and yeah, anyway, I think that's my Yeah, answer. that's, <laughs> no, it's, it, sure. what's, what's so amazing about what, what you're all touching on is, you know, brings me always back to the great Stuart Hall, you know, is that all of our identities are in constant production 
um, they're, they're mutable and never fixed. And so, so be, and because of our difference, because of the experience of difference and because of the celebration of it too. Um, and so it, it, it uh, I mean, I, I'm, that's why I'm compelled to always follow artists of, of you know, who operate within diasporic consciousness because it's always, you know, in it's always, I know there's always going to be something compelling and exciting that, that will be um, of great uh, interpolation. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm really interested to hear, uh, these are really interesting points that you're raising about how we come into embracing, you know, um, diaspora by choice or not, and that, or in every, every possible permutation and variation in between. Um, but, in, and it's important to understand that there are variations, right? That we can't flatten either the experiences of diaspora. Um, so I wanna talk now about um, the, the experience of diaspora is often being described as having the ability to be present in more cultures or places at the same time. And to have the sensation of being able to transcend or, or feel or uh, um, uh, sense time differently, you know, where past, present and future sort of you become kind of one thing or you feel them simultaneously. And, and notably, there's that reference that of Edward Said's about um, how how living in and with more than one culture produces that plurality of vision that quote gives rise to an awareness of simultaneous dimensions that to borrow a phrase from music is contrapuntal end quote. And I see that as being a key aspect of each of your bodies of work, this plurality of vision. So I'm wondering if, if each of you could share with us whether you feel if Edward is right if being contrapuntal is something like being in a place of freedom. I don't identify as a place of freedom because I think freedom is a, can be a very dangerous word. You know, I mean, the perspective is, is, uh, is really important. Who's freedom we're talking about? For me, it's a, it's a place of, it's a sense of, of complete, of, of sense of being complete, you know? Or if we're not complete, we're, we're kind of like, we're comfortable with the gap between, you know, these different experiences, these different pluralities. I think it's a matter, and I think when you're working in abstraction, when I'm working in abstraction, I'm in that space, you know, it's a space of creation where I'm juggling with something that is taking birth and something that is finite. And, and it's a place that is comfortable when you're dealing with multiplicity, because you're aware in the process of, of playing with different frequencies visually, you become more comfortable with that multiplicity. So that's how the work itself helped me uh, be comfortable with that, uh, with that space that I wouldn't necessarily identify to freedom, but to a sense of being complete because uh, my experience as a human being is embedded in this uh, multiple understanding of reality you know, for me. So. Um, that's how the work finds its way, find, it finds its way in the work and it cultivates itself inside of me, in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, super interesting. Curtis? I will hold on to the idea of freedom in the sense of um, like a weight being lifted. Uh, being considering my practice, I, I consider it decentralized. I have these moments in certain spaces that growing up, I felt not a part of one community, not a part of one, another community. You know, you feel you float in the, in the middle in the suburbs. Then I go to the city. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm with my white friends because I went to pretty much lived in a, like a hamlet, which is pretty much all white. Then I'm at the weekend Caribbean events. Um, I was sitting in South Africa in the sun and uh, a Kosa friend looked at me and said, to, right now you look like your ancestors, your, your, and I said, well, well, what, which ones? And he said, the Portuguese one, your nose looks. And I thought about that. And that right around that time I started, instead of, I can't control who my ancestors were. And I believe in the idea of genetic imagination. If we want to talk about trauma and genetic trauma and these things are built and stored in our cellular makeup, 
I wanted to begin to think of all the creative creativity and joy of all the ancestors. And instead of being ashamed or embarrassed of one, trying to embrace all of them to then, and that's when I finally felt like a freedom of self to be like, if I'm painting and creating this character that looks very Eurocentric in one hand, but he's standing next to uh, like a Senegalese looking figure, that is a way for me to be okay with this, this multiplicity, this, this unknown. And so it, it has provided a sense of just a freedom of, 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 of mental health self-care, you know, mm -hmm. just to be able to allow myself to play in these arenas and not feel like I'm rejecting one side and I'm rejecting another side. And mm -hmm. yeah, it brought a sense mm -hmm. of wholeness, completion, as you said. Who feels they want to address freedom as <laughs> as a as the result of a contrapuntal <laughs> experience? I, I love your your turn to phrase. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Rajni, Maya, do you mind if I? I go. Go ahead. Um, I. Uh, yeah, I, I just love these time, the, the, the chance of phrase of transcending time and past, present, future, and this idea of counterpoint and point and counterpoint. I, I drove my uh, my profs crazy in high school. They're they're like, you always have an answer for everything, and sometimes we just want you to take a stand on something. And I think my response was like, maybe, <laughs> <laughs> but it's like it in terms of that freedom. It it. Yeah, like when you when you were immersed in this kind of heterogenic view of the world, you can see many points of view, and they do all have a kind of validity to them. And you know, it makes it so you don't necessarily want to uh, champion any one point of view because to champion any one point of view means that some other point of view might suffer for it. So I think in terms of this idea of harmony that has uh, is made up of many different unique voices in that heterogenic way is much more interesting and dynamic and somewhere where I would like to dwell within um, not only in, in the world but in that space of the imagination where truly anything could happen and that is reflected in the canvas too, right? So I think Deleuze said, um, I don't know if you guys know uh, Deleuze, um, yes. that uh, an artist is never standing in front of a blank canvas looking to pull something out of the ether. Uh, everything that makes that artist who they are is already on the canvas and they're just choosing what to reveal. Mm. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, I'm down to go. Um, yeah, it's really, yeah, freedom is like a crazy thing to think about. Uh, I, my family came and just, and just in regards to diaspora and like bringing, and then many points of view coming together to create that. Um, my family came here because we didn't really have a choice. Like we didn't want to leave where we we're from, but we had to go around and go everywhere. And like, we were here, we ended up here as a last resort. And it's funny because the West is marketed to many third world countries as a place where you will have freedom now. And it's, it's crazy that, you know, we came here and all we can ever do is just work. And the quality of life is actually so much lower than we, where we came from, than where I came from living here. My parents came back here. I was trying to take care of them back home and, uh, and try to give them a, a decent quality of life back home where we came from. But they insisted that they wanted to be here. Like that has never left this idea of freedom that that the that the West markets to the East nonstop and it won't stop either, right? Because this is the this is late stage capitalism that's not going to end anytime soon. So it's just it's really funny because like in regards to diaspora and like many different diaspora sort of living, and I have an entire series called Traveler that's in the show that's about that's about the many points of view of uh, many different diasporic communities evolving and like mutating into something that is free, something that wins, mm. something that 
that does, but it's like, but there's ideas of like, you know, in terms of, the, there's so much obstacle. You need, you need, as it says in Ed Said's book, contrapuntality, to get to the place where you can get past everything, where you can beat obstacles, where you can like, and it's really funny because like, I also believe that like diaspora communities actually create culture and bring culture into what would otherwise be heterogeneous culture metropolitan centers. So it's like just really funny, like how many points of view and many different diaspora communities they'll they'll inform they'll inform the culture almost completely the culture of the places where like where where freedom the idea of freedom is even fabricated it's this really strange relationship where like in both in both places the place where it's marketed to and the place where it's being created actually feed off of one another mm -hmm. sorry that's my very really strange yeah. take on I the idea of freedom and passport communities no it's really it's really good sorry to jump in there but i was like i uh, uh on that dave chang's ugly delicious they we're exploring food in London and they were saying that <clears throat> curry was England's national food, like officially. <laughs> <laughs> it was really specific too. It's like lamb vindaloo or something like that. It's like really specific. <laughs> like it's a type of curry. Like everyone likes that one. It's like, oh, that's so interesting. <laughs> Manuel, did you want to jump back in? Or no, 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 no. Okay, oh my God. Ma look, okay. what she's saying is so interesting. I, I could, I think, I, I could talk to her for like a day about, yes. about that alone, you know, because uh, it's the same system with Haiti, you know, like yeah. the selling the freedom, and then you arrive and you're like, well, I gotta work yeah. like an animal, like for mm -hmm. that freedom. It's like a trap. Anyways, I definitely mm. relate to that. My parents moved back home, and I could hear it added years to their life. Yeah. Hearing, like hearing my mom, I remember like within the first few months of hearing her just consistently speak in her way, she sounded younger. I saw my mom recently and I didn't recognize her. And this has now been after seven years back in Trinidad. She came through the gate and I didn't recognize her. I saw my dad and recognized him because it looked like she was a whole new restored young woman. It was such wow. a trip. That's so crazy. We want to go back home. That's what's up. All right? I'm going to say it. We're yeah, I said it. Where we came from. I said it. I said it. Um, I want to go back home. I'm done with this conversation. Maya? Yeah, I love this conversation. Um, and I, I, I think one thing that's coming up that uh, is for me about the multiplicity um, is that uh, for me, like, it's making me think about taxonomy and categorization and how um, trapping that is. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that being from, you know, having that sort of uh, experience of having one kind of way of living with my family and then going to school and being around other people and just like very, I, I was born and raised in um, here in the United States. So I feel like in school, you know, everything is very, it's, it's either this or it's that, you know, like this very um, Western idea of thinking and time being linear, and that's the past, and this is now, and, and you know, don't worry about the past, we're not going to talk about that, we don't have ancestors, you know, and it's just really nice to hear you, you know, us talking about these things that have multi multiple layers, and I, and I think for me, um, you know, it always felt like there was some kind of way you were supposed to be um, this uh, I suppose um, American dream or or whatever assimilating into this ha being successful and you know getting married to a what, man and having a baby and well, all this stuff which is fine but it's you know if you don't fit into those categories then then where do you go and what do you do and and you know it's unfortunately you know it's, it's not good um, you know it, it just makes it harder so I feel like it's actually I think it took me a long time to realize that it's such a plus to have all of those different things um, happening at the same time and to also be able to be an artist. And I'm so happy that we can talk about painting because I just feel like painting really allows for so many things to be happening simultaneously. Um, and there's no answers, you know, it doesn't, you know, we don't have to 
it's not giving any answers, um, you know, and, and I love that, that space of uh, that art and, and painting in particular, you know, it kind of takes you onto this, I, 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 like, I never know what, I might set out to make a painting, but it always does something different, you know, and, and that I'm okay with, I, that's what I love about it, I'm always chasing that. Um, so I think like th these like unknowns um, are able to happen in, in that space of multiplicity. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe, maybe that's a good segue into this question I have about imagination because, um, you know, that is, that is something that really ties you all together really well is this idea that, um, well, my interpretation anyway, is that, um, you know, imagination is this space of radicality, which manifests itself, you know, on the work surface. Um, but permeates it as well. I don't know how you feel about that or whether it resonates with you, but I sure would like to know if it does or doesn't. <laughs> Do you, does that, is there an importance of the imagination of the, as a space of radicality for you? Wait, can I start? Because I keep going last. You go, go girl. <laughs> no, I have to say about that. Um, <laughs> um, I, I was reading this, um, book by this uh, author, Lenny Strobel Mendoza, who um, is a Filipino, you know, Filipino author. And she, she was talking about how um, a long time ago when the Spaniards were, you know, I guess, converting the Filipinos to Catholicism, um, the Filipinos would listen, you know, and, and it would be in Spanish, it wasn't their language, but they would hear just like little bits and pieces of it. And so then they would just take those little bits and pieces and then kind of go with it, you know, and that there, there was a, it wasn't necessarily like it was a direct translation, but that they would hear things that maybe stood out to them and then they would kind of apply their own, um, you know, imagination or ideas to those things and, and how then like sort of this religion developed, even though there'll be still many Catholic people, but that there was this, you know, the, the indigeneity of what they were learning and then being converted, but that that stuff just stayed there. Like it, you know, it was this sort of translated thing. And um, anyway, it makes me think, they called it like fish. It was like fishing, you're fishing. So you're catching some fish and then you just take it into your own. And I, I feel like I do, it really resonated when I read that because um, it just, it feels like that for me in the process, the art making process is like fishing, you know, it might be something that's, that's interesting. It might be taken out of totally out of context, but I have this sort of tacit knowledge or um, uh, innate knowledge that then, like Rick was saying, the the canvas is not blank. Like it, it's whatever is wants to come out or be shown. Um, so that, mm -hmm. but yes, I do think that imagination uh, is also layered in in time and and generation. That, that, that gets me to think about what you said in terms of, of changing, um, you know, the words. And there's something similar that happened during the repression uh, of superstition in Haiti by the states. Uh, we kind of changed, um, and obviously they were imposing some catalysts in Christianity, Christianity. And what, the, what voodoo did is that they turned these images of of saints you know into their own uh spirits you know there's a there's a reference from like Ezuli represents a particular deity uh in in uh image you know so they use those image references uh to still manage to um to connect with the the, the spirits they were they were uh they were um, that were valuable to them. That was, um, and something happens in that at that moment. What I, what I what and it's there's a connection with what you're saying is that there was a sense of radicality in the preservation of that connection, and that for me is something that resonates a lot with I think what I'm trying to do. Also, it's that idea that there's something that I'm trying to preserve. You know, and there's obstacles to that. And what am I going to integrate or completely disapprove in order to get to where I want to go? 
because we're talking about this is not about money this is not about wealth it's not about any of that it's like it's like a spiritual nurturing you know what i'm saying and uh the only thing that you get out of it it's that satisfaction of of being present in the world the way that you believe that is you you know through your culture through your through, through your spirituality and for me that's the that's a really important form of radicality in the imagination you know because i think there's no compromise you know and i think radicality should be close to what is necessary you know when it becomes necessary that's when you enter a space of radicality because you're not ready to compromise yeah. okay we have to deal with that they're coming to shatter our legacy uh okay we're still going to pray using their image but their, those image will be connected to our spirits uh and that's a kind of very profound way because um it's not necessarily tangible and what it feeds it's something that is very um profound you know because something that you feed and you carry with you and nothing can take that away as long as you keep nurturing it um Yeah, so that what you said made me think of that. I wasn't planning to answer that, but I think it makes a lot more sense because it's it's very very profound to me. Um that sense of preservation and necessity. Mhm. Mhm. I just want to follow up on that. Yep. I that you brought up that you brought up spirituality like spirits and god because because I don't know if you guys know but I work in science fiction a lot, right? and uh and i like to use like the metaphor of space travel and science like the metaphor of space travel and as a way to talk about immigrant resilience diasporic resilience and i always thought that that was something it's just like a it's let and it's it's amazing i really like that manuel brought up radicality out of necessity because like resilience out of this it's like the same like it's all like sort of a survival tactic one of the things that Absolutely. happens in my work is is uh i make new gods like there are there are things that that happen as like as diaspora moves around and changes a lot that i like into mutation that's biological and like imposed uh, or as or it happens as a result of of our environmental collapse so i like to sort of parallel those two things um as a way to to change like the gods and the spirits of diaspora communities moving forward out of necessity to have gods and spirits that are moving with changing times so for me uh for me talking about i i feel like resilience is radical and like um prosperity is too um mm-hmm. between especially marginalized commu- diaspora communities um and then for me using science fiction and space travel as a metaphor for that um it just made me think about that your question just made me think about about um uh space travel as a metaphor for for immigrant resilience and and the way that spirituality sort of changes with that too and our our need to have our our dreams and our need to have our ancestors close to us and our our spirit guides and our our folks who are you know you know out there out there for us protecting us. Mm. Mm. Damn, that thing should last all day, guys. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. Give me more of that. Me... <laughs> Rick Curtis. Key words necessity, survival. Definitely uh when I was thinking of a, a response, uh the idea of imagination. It's like I just break it down just while you were Irona was speaking. my parents leaving trinidad at 18 and uh 20 24 they had to imagine a future for me mm. so and that is like and now the ancestors before them had to imagine how do we get through this you have to have an imagination just to wake up in the morning and i think don't think is directly connected to art it doesn't have to be direct, directly connected to artistry and so uh it's to touch on a, a, a a question that I know you will ask later about uh, I don't want to bring it up too early but inheritance I feel like my inheritance then is just their imagination that they're they that we will uh, persevere mm. 
but oh, that's powerful, man. <laughs> I love Cheryl's face after all of our answers. <laughs> 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 I'm just like because I'm like you know I'm like I'm moving at a very high vibration right now I don't know yeah, if you can feel yeah, it yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's happening uh, Rick yeah I, I love I love all where this conversation is going I think it's amazing um, you know you work in the studio and largely by yourself and in your own head and you know you, you try to engage in the world, but it's really when it's you in the studio working through these things, you don't know the scope of them. And to hear these kinds of things from you guys is just like it's expanding my consciousness right now. It's like I, I love to hear that you're all thinking and working through these ideas and themes in this way. And I don't know, I, I just feel like it uh it's really it's it's really communal. Like it's strengthening this bond that I'm feeling with like uh, the world. Really, <laughs> I guess it's a bit much. But I um I, I love this idea of um you know the space this imagination this this idea of a space of radicality. Not only where anything could happen, anything that we can imagine, we can kind of create and manifest and visualize and present it to the world that other people can interact with. But I absolutely love that this link between spirituality in terms of our way of being in the world as creatives and manifesting our beliefs and our thoughts around our, our own spirituality uh, are coming through in the way that we're making and connecting with one another. Um, I think that's something that's really powerful. Uh, mm. And how that can transform too. So, you know, as this board is moving around the world, as we move around the world and we we take those ideas and they evolve with us and each of our unique uh, times and places, um, I think just makes for a really interesting um, uh, visualization of those things, you know? Um, and I'd love to see and, you know, I'll just again, I know I've said this already, but I'd love to see this show in person so I could see all these things and how they're happening together. Because I just sense, like, Cheryl, you must know this already. You're like, yes, I've seen it. I know this is happening. But for me, like for people, you know, like us to be able to see that happening in real time would be absolutely amazing. Also, I think for me, the I know I'm rambling a little bit, but my my contribution would be this idea of a utopia. And I think this kind of goes towards what Curtis was saying, uh, having to imagine a future for ourselves, for our children. Um, and we imagine it, we want it to be the best future that it can be. And I think I was talking a little bit with Cheryl about this the other day, but you know, utopia is existing solely in the future. Um, and it's constantly evolving uh, with us uh, as we evolve. and and our needs evolve, uh, it's constantly being reshaped and reformed. And I think that we're doing that, you know, with our work as well. Amen. Um, yeah, on and on. I, I, I love this. I love just being able to commute. I think these can, these, you know, the, this, the, the connection through each other and with um, spirituality kind of as a mode through which we, we connect with each other is are parts of these strategies for survival. I know that's what's gotten me through, you know, some really confusing times. And so to, to arrive at a place where we can have conversations like this, that's utopia, baby, if, if it could be, you know, described as something. But, um, but let's move on to this question about inheritance. I just, you know, the question, it was like this, I'm gonna put out this word, inheritance. And how might that resonate with you and, and aspects of your practices? My understanding of inheritance, like you're, you're giving me something that is, um, I don't want to say that is, that is whole, but um, that is defined, you know? And my understanding is that I'm not, I'm holding something and I'm supposed to channel and transfer its presence, you know, at many, many levels. Uh, and for me, it's a space that is more generative. It's a space that is, gives me more agency than the, the idea of inheritance. It's like, for me, it's like, in that space, 
the transfer of that, that it creates, it, when I'm in that space of, of, of agency, of, of transferring it or channeling it, I have a f- deeper connection to it and a s- different sense of preciousness, you know, because I am evolving with it. You know what I mean? And, and that's very, very important. I prefer seeing it like that than um, get the idea of giving something. And Goethe set us with, with her family um, in, a, in a beautiful way. I think this, um, that's how the connection I make in terms of the, the yeah, it, it brings a, a more personal relationship. It's like, what do I do with that inheritance? Because it's something that was inevitably through me transfer itself, whether it's through my actions, whether it's through um, my, uh, you know, my work, there is something happening at that level. So my focus is through the transfer and the channeling, you know, that other than preserving the inheritance, because it's something that was given to me, just like life. And I was, I will give it to my kids or my community or you know, the people that I'm sharing intimacy with. So in that space, it's just, it carries more preciousness. And, and, and I feel the need to preserve it more. Mm-hmm. Because it's part of my life, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I understand, John. Because I, I, I agree. I, I, that sounds a lot like, um, you know, my kind of take on it. Uh, you know, I there, there's there's a lot of ancestor worship in Chinese culture, and although I wasn't you know necessarily inculcated into many aspects of Chinese culture, that was one thing that my uh, grandmother ensured that I I did. <laughs> that was the most important thing. So you have to pray to your ancestors, and that's if that's all you do, that's that's at least the, this is the the thing the minimum that you got to do. But I think. Uh, it goes beyond acknowledgement, right? Um, uh, and I think it goes to that idea that you are in that long line of people who have come together and, um, you know, passed that baton, so to speak, um, to, uh, and, and, you know, life is that gift and to live your best life and to be a positive force in the world, I think is what that means. Um, to honor them, you know, and to uh, leave something for your the next generation as well, whether it's direct or, you know, in the community, like Manuel said, if that doesn't matter, uh, just as long as that you can have that, uh, be, be acknowledged that you are a link in a chain, that, mm-hmm. that you're, you know, there's a responsibility to continue to manifest that kind of those kinds of futures that we feel that need to be created. Rajni? Yeah, okay. I have such a weird... <laughs> <She's> like, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I like, can tell she was thinking about something and you caught her. She was like, Rajni, she's like, whoa, okay. okay I'm going to figure it out. <laughs> um, I have a really strange relationship with that idea. With the idea mm-hmm. of inheritance. And it's just kind of just like... Loaded. How I talk about this without being a downer. It's kind of a downer kind of way of looking at it but okay okay listen so so my my parents sold and dropped like everything to come here we came here with nothing just nothing and they're still like we're all still pretty broad I mean I'm an artist and we're all still like fairly broke you know and we didn't really make it back you know Mm -hmm. and like and like uh I've been trying to there have been so many sort of questions posed to me around ideas of um, ancestorship mm. and and they just like, you know, what are my roots back home? What are the roots back home? And it's really funny. I come from a colony. A lot of my culture has just been stolen away. So like, even if I were to try to look back on my family name before Portuguese, uh, colonization before I became Pereira, which, and I used to be like, and like all these much longer 
longer names with like deep roots and like really cool history, which is just kind of gone. So I'm in a very funny place in terms of inheritance. I'm in a really funny place of, I'm a first, I'm first generation. So like anything that goes to my kid, like I have to build that and have that idea. And I have to form the idea of what is inheritance to my child, making it new because we don't have like legacy per se to like pass forward, right? So I have to make that. And it's also a time when I'm like starting to go back home uh, and it's really funny because I had, there's a gallery in Colombo that represents me. I never thought that this would happen, but it's just like, it's really, really interesting what I'm finding out about myself going back home, the things that I do, sorry, my, my idea of what inheritance means is changing as I take more and more trips back home and almost forcefully take my own culture back for myself in the way that I kind of want to not in the way that the colonizers wanted to to hand my culture to me mm-hmm. i don't know if that makes any sense it's just such a, i have such a weird oh, yeah sentiment oh, no i get it makes a lot I, of sense that's yes. not a downer that's yeah, kind of no, an upper that's it you, yeah <laughs> i don't want to rain on everyone's like no 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 no, 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 no. <laughs> that's good rain it's hot in montreal good rain um yeah, Maya. Yeah, I I kind of, I'm not sure about this question either. Um, I mean, I think there are bits and pieces that I heard that resonate, but um, um, I, yeah, I'm not sure what that means exactly. Um, I can kind of see like, I guess, inheritance in terms, I, I, I too feel that I, it is uh, a developing thing within me. Um, I feel like uh I'm not yeah, I'm not really sure. Mm-hmm. It's a tough one because I I understand the well, Maya, the thing is is I guess when I think about about inheritance and I think about how you work so much with your family and um uh I and I do the same in my own work. I'm always they're like, oh damn me again, like my my parents are like, oh geez. You know, uh, and 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 uh, I feel like there's a desire. You know, there's a desire to speak. You know, their story, and and to and I and I take that as an as my inherited duty to to tell their stories. And I and so I see that in your work. And I don't know if if, if you would if that helps at all. What I'm trying to tease out, you know, of this discussion, but in some ways that that part of the transmission or the transfer, you know, that Manuel was talking about. And, but it's loaded too, um, because there's this, you know, to, to cite like Kobina Mercer, you know, this, this, there's a burden of representation that also can come with that. And I'm not sure if inheritance becomes loaded with these kinds of, of questions too. Definitely, it's not a, it's not going to be a neutral. Mm-hmm. I mean, does that resonate? Do, is what I'm saying like kind of inspire yeah. any other? Yeah, I I feel yeah, thank you. like the. Yeah, ahead, Sorry, no, you. I don't. Yep, yeah, if you want. Oh, I think what you just said, Cheryl. Um, it does. It does feel like there also was mentioned. I think Manuel said this pres- preservation. Um, uh, preservation and preservation. Um, but um, something coming through uh, this channeling of being an artist and that this happens to be the topic of my work. I mean, I didn't, don't feel like I chose that, but there is something that is important in that in, the, in terms of inheritance. And also, as I mentioned before, these gaps of like not knowing, um, you know, beyond uh, uh, grandparents, great grandparents, and then it's just, and I don't know what, what's before that. So there is maybe that um, being in this generation being some, a bridge to bring those things through. I imagine, I imagine in the cultures that we all arrive from, there is a word that would succinctly describe what you're talking about. Because when we look up the definition of inheritance, it's directly connected to this colonial structure of land and 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 monetary and and it's like the s the word is wrong 
the feeling that we're all trying to touch again is in, in, in cohesion with the relation, the idea of that title. Like we know what you're trying to ask, but the word is wrong. Then uh, that's sometimes so frustrating that the, the the language that we have to kind of describe these 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 spaces that we're working in it just doesn't it's it's just, it's just inaccurate. Yeah, mm-hmm. I have to be honest. When I heard the word in- inheritance, I felt angst. Yeah. Because you know some kids from school who got their inheritance and now have a studio. And, like, oh, inheritance! Oh, yeah. Started, started, yeah, you're right. Totally right, Chris. That is very, very true. Um, I, I just like to link that idea of inheritance with ancestor worship. Like, I, I had this thing where I, I think that we all become landscape whether we are buried and decomposed or we're cremated and became, become atmosphere, which, is, which essentially means we're surrounded by our ancestors and we're surrounded by our inheritance. So, mm-hmm. you know, in how we inhabit that, that landscape and that world, I think is part of that inheritance. It's how, so how we... You're, you know, what you're saying is really, is really beautiful because the different cultures that we have, you're coming from, like you said, Curtis, we have a different relationship with what that word is trying to carry. You know, like this idea that we're becoming the land is extremely mm. relevant and important. You know what I mean? And that's that connection, you know, that the First Nations might have with the land and the, 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 the air and the, the mountains and the trees is part of their inheritance to a certain point. But when you come and you redefine that structure, what is the, what is, because what you're asking is like also in the power structures of what is necessary to be transferred, what is valuable to be transferred. And when you're entering this, this ecosystem of checking what is valuable or not, then you got to ask who's checking those boxes and for what agenda and, you know, what happens to those boxes that are not checked? You know what I mean? And then when we're addressing these things in art and we are bringing, again, this idea of inheritance in them, while at a particular moment, what we're trying to channel wasn't in the discussion, then we have a problem. Because, you know, art is spirituality. And if, uh, if your power resides in defining and valuing my spirituality, then we have a problem. We have a connection problem. We cannot have a discussion if um, everything that I am, you don't value in that, in those elements. And the problem is like, why are you in the position to value me? You know what, like, what is the, that's kind of like also part of the problem because, and again, it gets back to the gaze that I was telling you in the beginning. It's kind of like, we're always under a certain gaze that is, that is defining us outside of us constantly. And we need to compose with that so we spend less time with ourselves. You know? It's um, mm. there's a lot to unpack there. No, it's clearly, a, whew, yeah, it's clearly a very charged up, you know, word that I think has, you know, is, is, has a dual edge. Um, I, I may, I may personally connect with it in, in terms of uh, more of like a connection with ancestors, you know, and, and these traditions oh, and cultures and ideas that, uh, that I connect with, but, and, and want to, tra- and then retransmit. Um, but inheritance, as Curtis pointed out, and Rajni as well, does come with a uh, um, uh, colonialist uh, uh, um, underpinning uh, and, and, and in terms of that power dynamic, and I guess that's why, you know, when I think about it, I also think about, you know, the burden of representation as artists, you know, to to have to, to want to, you know, address these issues, but then also for whose gaze, right? And, and, and what are the optics around, you know, the performative in that respect? And how does that, how can that get turned around mm-hmm. um, and work, you know, sort of, in 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 count, counter to you know the the uh um, the wave. yes <laughs> uh, the, there's a painting i did i'm working on right now it's called a sacred burden and i'm talking about that because it's in relation to what you're saying because you know coming from countries 
that are suffering, you know, like, especially right these days, this painting came because these days, Haiti is in terrible shape. I mean, very, very dangerous right now. And that legacy, sometimes I carry it like a burden, you know, yeah. because that idea of multiplicity, when I project myself in Haiti, I don't feel safe. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? But I have yes. the capacity to project myself, you know, in cinema. And I talked maybe to you about that, you know, this technique of cross-cutting, cross-cutting mm -hmm. and editing is when they're showing you two actions or three actions happening at the same time. And that's how I feel. That's how the multiplicity works for me. You know, I am emotionally present in my studio here, but I'm also emotionally present in Haiti. And when I am present emotionally there, it's hard. It's hard because, uh, because, because it's dangerous. You know, it's not just mentally dangerous. It's kind of like you can get killed. And it becomes a burden, but it's something that is still sacred to me. You know, mm -hmm. it's something that I wouldn't, gam I wouldn't gamble it. I wouldn't be like, no, have it. It's like, no, I want that burden because it's mine, you know? It's home. Yeah, it's mine. That's what I'm saying. It's home. Yeah. It's kind of like this is whatever you, you're going to, I mean, I don't know what to say, but it's kind of like, uh, and I'm saying that because of your connection with what you said with the burden. But for me, that burden is sacred, you know? Um, I like and I'm that. composing with it. I'm trying to figure out what does that also mean to carry a sacred burden? Mm. Did, this, I know this is um, pretty much uh, kind of the close of this part of it. Um, but before I move on, just to like a light question to, to, to end this part of the discussion, does anyone else want to say something, um, you know, about in response to, or I don't know about this conversation that we've been having, any other sort of remarks or thoughts? How do we, how do we keep this conversation going? Beyond this, beyond this, you know. Preach, like, preach, <laughs> preach, brother, preach. <laughs> uh, it'd be yeah, wonderful to figure out how, how and what ways we could do that. That that's excellent. That's a great question. Um, yeah, thanks. I think we need to. I mean, I'm thinking about that all the time, and 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 I'm glad to have such incredible allies, and that we make a great team. I Curtis, a way to keep it going is more like, and I know you preconceived the idea for this show long before the institutions are all now trying to play catch up. And but with this, sh hopefully, shift and change with the institutions, that it'll be easy as easy as it is to like hop on and see a museum talking about. <sighs> modernism or whatever it will be as easy to and this won't be a rare or like a special occasion that this will just be part of the dialogue and that these new, so new, yes. the new yes. retinies at ocad and all these spaces will just be like yeah mm -hmm. this is this is what we do mm -hmm. that's that's the hope yep 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 sense of responsibility mm -mm. rajni did you want to say anything else before oh. You're, I agree with what Curtis said. That's pretty, that's good. This should just be regular. That's it. it. Just Everyday regular. business. Yes. Really yes. Tying yes. into the conversation as, as in the same, exact same trajectory of completely normalizing this type of conversation. This is, should not be a special okay. conversation. Yeah. Well, then, by way of a fun bonus question, before we move to Q&A, Tell us a little bit about yourselves and how you operate in the studio. <laughs> That's a good. Like, you know what might how you, you? How you? You know. How you what might you? Why <laughs> wait? What? Your what shoulders. Do you, <laughs> I know it's like I'm going in now. What yeah. might you? I don't know. Eat or drink or you know what do you wear when you're in the studio? Like what kind of music might you listen to? Just a little sharing of things. Little, little bit of secrets. us. <laughs> I have a weird like studio pink, like a weird a studio pink <laughs> where I have to have background noise that's going, and it has to be either the U.S. Office, the Office, the U.S. version, or X Files. 
<laughs> or X-Files. in the background on very low volume. Most of the time. I'll also so have it like Sailor Moon can go or Robotech, but low volume. Like, I can't do it. But I have to have it. It's got to be going on. So there oh you man, go. that's gonna be hard to beat though, because this is like <laughs> higher level, you know. <laughs> yeah, it is like low volume. It is like the background is kind of yeah. like damn. Just leave there. Like, like, so. oh, that's nice. That's a good one. Who's next? Right? Uh, that's good. Uh, well, it's I legal know. in Canada. Yeah. What it? Well, it's legal in Canada. And whatever is legal in Canada, I try to practice as a good Canadian in my European studio as well. Uh, <laughs> uh, nice. That's uh, nice. Yeah, Maya. <laughs> um, gosh, what do I have? I, uh, I feel so boring next to you all. I, um, I kind of like just like silence. Well, you do already um, one. So <laughs> Silence and uh, um, I have a, actually because of the the COVID, I was away from my studio for about three months, um, mm. and I just got back about two weeks ago. And I I have this I have a couple of like little rocks and crystals that I have at the studio, and I had this bird feather that I found near my studio. So I I just uh, you know I had a, a friend was saying you know you should do um, like the last time she came to the studio, we ate some donuts. So I got a, she was like, why don't you have, get a donut and, and, you know, get a ritual going in your studio. So I went to Dunkin' Donuts. I got a donut and uh, I took my feather and I went around my studio and I just kind of like left it. And I was like, I'm back. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so I enjoyed my donut and, and my feather. So that was my most recent thing. I say yes to donuts. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Rajni, there, there's something you said about, you know, the background noise, interestingly, means the opposite. You know, sometimes I need to be sitting in silence, you know, but the silence that is like, there's nothing, you know, and I just look around, I just like lay, it's kind of like these moments are kind of precious to me. Yeah, well, you're, you know, in, I, you're in Montreal, I think you have the option of being in a silent building, silent place. <laughs> I'm in Toronto, well, well. Yeah, nothing. nothing. So Reality that, is the, the, the yeah the, to, to cover the the actual noise. But I mean, it, it works also at night, you know, because oh, I yeah. work any. I mean, I work all the time. So you know, at twelve, at eleven o'clock at night around the studio, you know, it's very kind of dead. And I really like that. And I mean, the other things are like flowers. I really love flowers. I have flowers mm -hmm. right next to me. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. I see uh, that. I mean, I, yeah, for sure. I grew up in nature. So let me see if you can, because I can't see. Can you see them? Oh, yeah. God. Beautiful. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. So, uh, so, you know, I really like, uh, I really like that in whiskey. You know, I was, try, I was trying to discover a new, a new kind of, you know, uh, a new Enjoy. bottle once in a while. Yeah. So, so that's kind of like the, it's kind of weird. I'm like sitting in silence, looking at flowers, <laughs> drinking whiskey. It's kind of like oh, that actually sounds pretty good. It's, like, yeah. it's like, oh, poor little thing. You on your own? Are you okay? I love my flowers. <laughs> I I love that you know there's such a ritual aspect to to making, right? and it's all different. Um, I probably share in a little bit of all of those, although I. I I I find it hard to sit in silence personally. Um, I my thing is uh, I love to dance. So if I'm in a group, uh, if I'm stuck in a rut, or if I'm just burned and tired and it's got to like push through, I'll just like crank the K Trinata, the Childish Gambino, or something, and dance it out, and I'm back in the zone, and I'm right mm -hmm. there. Oh yeah. yes. Nice. Yes. <laughs> oh my god. All of these things like in one studio. Like a one like yeah. a party <laughs> studio with all these things at once, you know? Oh man. That sounds like a party to me, you know. You got That's Curtis, nice. you got whiskey, <laughs> you got like, you know, it's got like flowers, and then you have like Rick's dancing around. Robotech. Robotech. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a win to me. <laughs> 
I'm down. Oh, it, Sounds like a residency. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that's hell right. yeah. Now we're talking. <laughs> now we're talking. I think, uh-huh, I, think we, uh-huh. I think we can get a candidate council grant for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, nice. So listen, let me uh, turn it over to Rehab. Sorry, Rehab, we, we, we we're a little uh, into your um, Q&A, but... Uh, no, no worries. Uh, this is so interesting. Go, you, like, you go. You take the space now. I adore this. Okay. Um, I already have some questions from the public. I don't know if you can hear me. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Great. So I already have uh, one question from Jacqueline uh, asking about like um, specifically uh, one of her, an, an artist uh, from Chinese diaspora uh, once told her um, that she was really wary about having her word read as manifesting her cultural heritage and uh, identity and politic and often can be a contradictory. So I wanted to know, she wanted to know a bit more about how do you, um, how do your work represent or reject this sort of limitation of like this categorization and representation, this need of that? Hmm. Can I I jump into that? I'd say it's, you know, you get to set the rules, you get to set set the parameters of your own creative practice. And, you know, what's worked for me, which you might find you, you might need a different approach, but it's to have this kind of yes and attitude, not either or. Mm-hmm. No, wonderful. Okay, I'll try not to touch the wire. <laughs> I've been... um, I have also, I have a personal question directly uh, to uh, Maya. Because we, I want to know a bit more about your work specifically. Um, also, yeah. So Maya, I want to know a bit more just that, like, you look a lot of uh, at archival photography, and I'm sort of specifically with the two works presented in the gallery right now. There's sort of a sense of a gaze, and almost like reclaiming this gaze of this col- uh, colonialism uh, view of that archival. And I wanted to know a bit more about your process and your choices in that specific uh, work. And a bit of everyone like working about a lot with like your heritage and archival material, like how do you replace yourself through someone else's uh, gaze? Thanks for that question. Um, and I love that we just had this conversation and, and I love what Curtis said about this just being the normal because I feel like sometimes those things, like for me, talk, making work about my family, I always thought, who's going to care? You know, who cares about this story? It's not like I'm not doing minimalism or whatever, whatever that everyone else is doing. So um, this is just really wonderful to have. And and in terms of the archival photography, I, I, I do look at um, this archive specifically from the U.S. government around the time when they colonized the Philippines. And um, for me, the exercise of of looking, like that's kind of how I learned where I came from. Um, you know, I, my, I heard stories, but I was always just kind of like quietly looking at pictures and looking at the places that they were at and just really curious. So I, I just look at the pictures. I just look at them for a long time. And um, there are certain figures or um, things that sort of stand out to me. And um, some of the, I think maybe, uh, can you describe the, which, pieces are they is it uh somebody like writing or is it um the two pieces that we have shown there's the place i thought wait i have i don't have the name of them exactly um yes, the i think death. i know which one you're talking about yeah the no, death. Yeah, yeah so there there were some of these um images of the the schooling that the united states started in the philippines so there were these pictures of the schools and they were sort of showing like look what we're doing we're civilizing them we're teaching them english and there were just, some of the students were just looking straight at the camera, like, dude, I see you, and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, F you, you know, that kind of thing. So those figures for me, I was like, oh, I see you, and I'm going to put you in this painting. And, like, because I think what I'm looking at, when I'm looking at them, I'm looking for something that I, I guess I'm kind of looking for my own, you know, to relate. And, um, and in this situation of colonization, it's very blatant. Um, they had this really rebellious um, kind of gestures or looks to them. Um, so then in the painting process, it becomes 
um, something my, then my imagination comes in and they're doing they're sort of having agency over their own uh, experience so they're about to, there's potential where they're about to write something or they're about to draw something or they're about to paint something mm -hmm. I'm listening to your answer and uh, how can you be working so close to each other guys like it's scary to me right now you know like we overlap so much at so many levels you know but we're like definitely different you know with a complete different past in history but we kind of like i mean i don't know i don't know this is like a matrix moment for me you know it's kind of i'm hearing you uh you know my and i'm like this is you know anyways i just wanted to put it out there because it's really i don't know i don't even know what, what i what, what i feel about that it's weird no, I think it's beautiful. It's almost like documenting like a small act of defiance and yeah. like and just being completely present. I don't know, I really adore it. And just because uh Hash needs to go soon, I'll ask her a question um right away. Um so also it's a bit more present so in in regard of now uh, the movement of Black Lives Matter. Um, you've removed one of her of her series, uh, Africa Galactica, and um, I wanted to know a bit more about sort of acknowledging herself, acknowledging um, not really our mistakes, but like how can we support each other within the Black uh, POC and Indigenous artists group, like and acknowledge our uh, differences while not really like taking advantage because the problem in that like you, what you've talked about us really specifically is um, you were showcasing black and brown women in this completely empowering position but you felt like those uh, voices were not yours completely I don't know if you want to elaborate and um, talk speak a bit more about that before yeah, you go. Thanks for asking that question so that's something that I've been thinking about for quite a while to do and then a lot of it was of course in response to and there's not i mean that is a series that like i very proudly made like 10 years ago and of course i think at that time, like identity politics is something that changes non-stop and it really yeah. needs to it has to so that things mm -hmm. get better for everybody so 10 years ago when i was making the series it was received extremely well it was like black bought and owned and written about by scholars and published and it did very very well a lot quite a few of them were donated and uh, i feel very very happy about like the places that the, all the paintings went you know what i'm saying like they didn't go to like weird bougie white houses like they went to the right places so it was like okay um i was thinking about that and then of course you know like two years ago i started to kind of uh get these comments that made me feel like oh you know what i think it's wrong that that I was depicting, sort of fabricating these black female identities. And maybe not identity, but a representation, right? So, and the need to create that series came from growing up in like primarily Caribbean neighborhoods, which is where I come from in the greater Toronto area. So it's like, for me, it was super natural to make this work, but in changing political, uh, changing political landscape, and as issues of representation start to become refined, and that's what happens with those things, just naturally anyway, um, as we work on it, I felt it's my time to step down, step back, and to take that series down. Mind you, that series is still up and like active in the ways that like, that I think benefit people, like, you know, all of the black buyers of that work and who claim that it inspires their children to feel great about their bodies and their color and their hair and their, whatever that they, it is that they want to wear. Like, I feel really happy that it is in those places doing some good for some people. But uh, I felt it was my responsibility to take it down off my site and also to like make the images free for use for whoever needs to, wants to use it in, in, a pro in the proper way, in a rightful way. So, so I just like released the series. I just want to say, uh, with no buts or ands or anything. When I first moved to Toronto, it was 10 years ago when you were graduating and I saw that series. And I so I followed what you were saying online and someone asked the question and told me, someone asked them the question of like, when did you become woke? And mm. that idea of, there was a time before when we just didn't know. If I was to listen back to the music yeah. that I made 
oh my god i was so i was so satisfied with the way because at first i was like she doesn't need to but i'm not a black woman yeah so i'm not mm-hmm. even going to speak about that no nope. but mm-hmm. then the way you did it it didn't come from a place of like oh i feel guilty or yes i see people doing this thing from their shame of and it was like no, that was needed at that time because when I went to OCAD, there was no black bodies or brown bodies on that yeah, floor. Was but there. those were. Yeah. So Thanks. to see you move, it was educational for me to be like, oh, let me look at what I've done in the past as well. So I love how you just you navigated that whole Thank awareness you. and new situation. Yeah, man. I- just needed to like make it and it's also you know like there were the comments were sort of building of black and some of them were you know mm. of and i'm not mentioning names at all of black no. mm. that were depicted depicted in the series who no longer they were just like oh you know like, take it down or you know it makes me feel uncomfortable yeah. and then, of course i took stuff down straight away i compensated somewhat like you know it's just like yeah you don't have to move like that it's just like look identity politics changes the way you feel comfortable in your representation and by whom it's going to change all the time we have to respect that and like move move with it like bruce lee said move it like water you yeah. got to do that yeah. you have to fit around you have to fit around so so i was very happy to, to to take it down like and do it in that way and i'm glad that you that it was beneficial to to anybody i mostly did it for myself and also to stand in the right place mm-hmm. so that things heal and get well get better mm-hmm. No, I love it. Thank you so much for the insight. Thank you, guys. Oh, no, I have to go. Yeah, that's why. <laughs> so it's like, don't miss before you go. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, wonderful. As Rajni leaves. I have a, uh, it's late here, and I have a partner that's a pregnant partner who hasn't been able to use the kitchen and properly eat. So, <laughs> and I get no Wi Fi in the room. So, I'm going to use that as my exit to thank everyone as well for this yes. conversation. Thanks to the foundation for bringing these group of people together and these artists together. It's a show that I'm yes, very, yes, very yes. proud of. And I feel like as identity and all these things change this isn't something at least that i don't feel like we'll have to take down years from now i feel like this was a really positive step forward yes definitely thanks you guys say it the best thank you thanks to everyone bye Bye, Bye, curtis pleasure meeting you you, curtis and rajni such a pleasure thank you everyone thanks reba victoria dahlia um for all your hard work getting this together um you know my 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 you know greatest thanks to you for you the generosity of these artists for sharing you know today um you know i i can't believe how much we have well i can't believe how much we have to say to each other what am i saying Mm -hmm. Uh, our next our next panel is going to be on on august 20th and we'll be announcing that really soon um but thank you all all y'all on four pages of zoom folk for engaging with us and like making this a true event, um, you know, we really can't thank you enough. Great gratitude to you all and, you know, be well, thank you. Mm-hmm.